Home games, away games, games on the moon, it don't matter. We gotta win all of them. Lift off. That's one small step for man, one giant for man. The Eagle has landed. Lift off. 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 Welcome to the three weeks after the NBA draft draft special edition of the layup line. I'm your host, Kyle Radke, and with Julian Andrews, who did not get drafted. I did not get drafted. Is this is this an emergency podcast, Kyle? Um I, I don't I don't think so, but kind of, I guess. Yeah. It's an emergency for us. Yeah, it is. We'll uh, take it. It's an emergency because the Timberwolves just announced that they have acquired uh the rights to Guard forward Jarrett Culver from Texas Tech. I, for one, did not see this coming. Uh, no. Oh, First time hearing about this is actually today. This is wild. Um, what an unexpected move. Um, it was first reported on draft night, um, but it's not official until now uh, that the Wolves traded Dario Saric and Cam Johnson, um, who was the 11th pick, uh, to the Phoenix Suns. So, uh, interesting trade. Um Obviously, uh, I guess we're not going to like play dumb here. We we all saw the 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 Woj right. bombs yeah. and and as it was breaking and and the Wolves are you know trade up and um, I guess what were your thoughts initially after uh, the the Wolves made the trade and drafted Culver? I loved it. Um, I mean, I liked the trade before we drafted Culver um, and and after we drafted Culver. But I I just think that you don't really get opportunities to move up in the draft. So to have it work out so that you could move up, um, obviously, you know, Sharch was a good player and we wish him the best in Phoenix. Um, but this is the type of opportunity to put like a young, a really, really promising young piece as part of this young core that you really don't get every day. Um, and I think Gerson Rosas is fully aware of that. And so to see him and his new front office really jump at that opportunity and take advantage of an, a chance to really make a move to make the team better is really exciting. It's just it's just exciting to have some movement and see that kind of aggressiveness that he was talking about play out. And I really like the pick too. I think Culver will fit really well with this team. Yeah, and it, like just from we talked about this throughout the whole draft process, how the board, the draft board, kind of um, there was a gap, right? Yeah, where for it sure. was. Everybody was it was Zion number one, right? That's one tier. Yep. Uh, the second tier, depending on how you felt about players, it was the John Morant. Uh, John, Morant. John Morant. It was the John Morant and R.J. Barrett tier, right? Yeah. And then it was kind of the the next tier was your DeAndre Hunter, your Jarrett Culver, your Darius Garland, and then depending on how you feel about Kobe White, right. you could put him there. Yeah. But then after that, there was a drop off for sure. Um, and and I think that's why you saw there was just nobody really knew where all those guys were yeah. going to go. You know, we, you could have told me Brandon Clark was going to be the number 10 or 11th pick. And then he fell to the twenties and yeah. Cam Johnson, a guy who we thought was going to go late in the first round yeah. ends up going 11. Yep. Um, so there, and I, you know, that basically tells the whole story. We knew who the top eight guys were going to be. Um, and Rosas positioned the wolves to get into that group for sure. Uh, and I think Brett Brown said it last year when the, the, the team, uh, the 76ers acquired Zaire Smith, uh, that he's in the star hunting business, mm -hmm. which it's a flashy business to be in. Right. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's kind of the same thing the Wolves did here where, okay, so you get a role player at number 11. Um, how much does that do for you? Are they going to be able to play? Because this is, a, on paper, that's a pretty deep roster, I yeah. think. Um, and then instead you go, okay, well, we know Culver can play. And... Uh, you know, I, I just think it's a really good move. If your goal is to be in the playoffs every year and be in the hunt for championships, this is the type of move you have to make. Because obviously last year's team, as it was constructed, didn't get there. And so you you look at Sharks and you say, this is a good player, like we like him. But also you look at Culver and you look at the draft and just say, this could be a guy who's really a cornerstone of the franchise for a long time. Um, and obviously we'll see it's, it's very easy to do all of this speculation and analysis before we've ever seen him play an mm -hmm. NBA game. Um, and it will be interesting to see him at summer league, but this is the type of thing that you have to do if, if you're in the business of star hunting and the wolves should be, I think, I think that's a perfectly valid approach to trying to build out some pieces in this roster right now. Yeah. And I think if you look at it, 
you know, without getting too much into, into player contracts, which we really can't do, but with, with the Dario thing, we liked him here. Um, he, I think it, w- it was really tough for him to adjust, I think, yeah. just because he was such a beloved player in Philadelphia. Yep. And um, I think he came over and he didn't really know what his role was right away. Yep. And he was kind of learning on the run, which is to be expected. But also, uh, you know, his rookie contract is up soon and then you have to make a decision yep. on whether or not you want to sign these guys. And a lot of times for players like Dario, you kind of end up overpaying for them, um, which is just what happens. Yeah. In it's the just NBA. the market. Yeah. yeah. So you, so you have to make a decision on whether or not you want to keep somebody like him who, who is a good player and probably a rotational player on a playoff team. Um, you know, and, and I think, Gerson alluded to the fact that we'll see Robert Robert Covington play more of the four um, next year, which is just kind of like if you're another team and the lineup coming at you is, uh, yeah. you know, right? Like yeah. W- whether it's Teague at, at the point guard and then you have Wiggins, Culver, Covington, and, you know, uh, Towns in the middle, and then whether or not you add in a Kogi there. Yeah. Like defensively, that, that is a pretty scary lineup. Totally. With, with, that, that's long. And then offensively, like – what intrigues me so much about Culver isn't that like not one thing when you watch him play, like not one thing makes you go like, Oh my goodness gracious. Yeah. Right. Like this guy, you know, I, I think you look at somebody like Zion, right. You're like, every time he throws down a dunk, you're like, Jesus Louise. Yeah. And like John, <laughs> yeah. John Moran is so, so fast with Culver. It's not like one thing yeah. you watch him play and you're like, Oh wow. It's the fact that he can do everything mm-hmm. at a very high level, including defend and like those are the type of players that succeed. And like we wrote a, a roundtable on this. You can go check it over, check it up, uh, check it out over at Timberwolves.com. But I kind of make the comparison to Paul George. And like when Paul George came out of Fresno State, like he he wasn't this, wor- like he wasn't this all defensive two way player. Uh, he was a lot like Culver is. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's uh, you know a direct comparison, but like they remind me a lot of each other early in their careers. Yeah, the cutting, uh, I think, is something that Rosas talked about. There's there's not competing, but there's two big theories about how you space the floor around big men, and Rosas talked a little bit about this on draft night. There's the shooting, which I think Culver will be able to develop. I have no I mean, he, he, and I have no concerns really about his shooting. He shot 38% percent from the three-point line yeah. as a freshman, and then as a sophomore, and, uh, you know, he kind of talked about this, but he wasn't, he was asked to do more. Um, yeah. and of course your shot, like your when, when you take harder shots, yeah. your percentage is going to go down. Totally. So, and at the NBA level, he'll be getting easier shots right. because he's not the top option offensively. Yeah. Not even close. I mean, he'll be, he's, he'll be pretty unproven right away and that will help him get some open looks. And if you look at Towns' growth as a passer in the last couple of months of the season, especially, and some of the chemistry you had with a player like Keita Bates Diop, uh, that is really, uh, intriguing to me because Culver I think is going to be an elite cutter and he's very smart so he'll be able to see when his guy or you know when the floor gets kind of sucked into Towns as it does because he's such a dominant post player or when Towns is out on the perimeter there's a lot of space in the middle Uh, I think Culver will really be able to take advantage of that so I think the pairing between the two of them is really exciting yeah when I watched the NBA finals it like a lot of it was just like oh wow like you think about with draft prospects, you think about who could and who couldn't play. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think right, right now you look at like Philadelphia's roster const- uh, construction. Last year they had so many centers and yeah. like they had like five centers on the roster and like none of them could play in yep. the playoffs, right? Um, so I think like you look at a guy like Culver who can probably guard a, like three positions at least, yeah. you know, point guard, shooting guard, small forward. Um, Maybe some power forwards if, if it's like super. He small won't get ball. burned if he gets switched. You don't yeah. like you don't start him on a power no. forward, but it's not the end of the world. But if he, he could ends up there. Be there, yeah. Um, and then you watch him offensively, and he's just super versatile. Like you know, watching the playoffs, and it's like you can't tell me that. Like I mean, Quinn Cook might be a better shooter, but like some of those guys getting minutes right. are better than Culver, um, and especially what Culver is going to end up being. Um, you know, another thing that intrigues me, we, we, after this, uh, spoiler alert, we have an interview with Chris Beard, Texas Tech head coach, and he's going to kind of talk about Culver's uh, transition to the NBA and, and, you know, what he knows about him. And, and Beard kind of alludes to this. But basically, like Culver said, I like we we're talking at the Combine, he was just talking about how hard of a worker he is and basically how, like, basketball is it for him. Like, yeah. he wants to be great and, like, this is all he works on. Yep. 
And sometimes when people say that at the combine, you roll your eyes because that's what everybody says at the NBA combine. Right. But with Culver, it seems like it's actually true. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, these are, I'm not saying that Jared Culver is going to be KD. Like, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. Yeah. But you see these great players like KD who really live and breathe basketball. And so when you hear something about a guy like that, it definitely gets your attention. Um, and so I, I just, I think that to really, it's like with any draft, you can't really tell how effective it is for years to come. Um, and so I guess when we see how Culver is in 2022 mm-hmm. or whatever, then then we'll really know if they nailed this pick. But I, I don't really see a world where this isn't at least a good pick. Yeah. With we'll the potential look, to be a great one. Yeah. And, and we'll look back in 2022 when you'll you'll turn 16, you can drive then. Um, <laughs> God. But I, I think that it, with how hard he works and how dedicated he is, at the like you're not Culver's not going to be a bad NBA player. No, like he no. It, 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 his floor is so high. I don't know how high his ceiling is. Um, I don't. But it, as far as his floor goes, like it feels like rotational NBA player. Yeah, hundred percent on a on a good team, which is all you can really ask for. So um, with that, uh, we'll go to this interview with Chris Beard. Uh, make sure to go to Timberwolves.com. We have a bunch of summer league content. We'll have uh, a bunch of behind the scenes stuff with Jarrett Culver out in Las Vegas. Kyle is actually in Las Vegas right now. Yep. It's very hot. It's a hundred degrees. So don't come to Las Vegas in July <laughs> unless you're going to summer league, but, uh, enjoy this interview. Uh, thank you to the folks over at Texas tech and Chris Beard for helping us out for with sure. this. We have a very special guest today, uh, Texas Tech head coach Chris Beard. Uh, Chris, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, it's going to be all uh, Jarrett Culver talk, and, and rightfully so. Um, the Wolves trade up and get him at number six. What makes Culver such a good fit uh, uh, with the Timberwolves? Well, I, um, you know, I'm a huge NBA fan, so obviously my world's college basketball, but I know enough about the NBA to know this that they're, you know, they're trying to build a program in Minnesota and coach is a culture guy and he's trying to build it the right way. Um, and I think Jared fits that perfectly. You know, Jared's a guy that number one is a high character guy. Um, great teammate. He's a winner. Um, obviously he's very, very talented, uh, or you wouldn't be a lottery pick, but it's the intangibles that make Culver special. Um, and I think it goes, it, it coincides perfectly with what I think coach is trying to build in Minnesota. That's what I kind of noticed at the combine when when you talk to certain players. Um, Jarrett, you know, he talked about his game, sure, but he talked more about how hard he was going to work and, and his work ethic. And and obviously um, on draft night, he he kind of talked about how he was going right to the gym um, after the draft. I mean, is he really like that? Is he really just kind of a gym rat? That that I mean, he's going to succeed. Um, yes, he has a talent, but because he just works so hard. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Culver is. Exactly that. Uh, there's zero fluff to him. There's, um, it's not just talk. I mean, he backs it up. I think at the core of who he is, um, he loves basketball. He uh, he plays the game for all the right reasons. Um, it's a it's a real love of the game. I mean, his story has been well documented. It'll continue to be even published more. But you know, he goes from being a non top 100 recruit to basically one of, if not the best player in college basketball last year. Two short years later, you know, he's a lottery pick. And at the core of that, you know, obviously he has talent, length, athleticism, IQ, toughness. Um, these are things that most people can see with the naked eye. But um, what he really is that people in Minnesota will find out very quickly is he, he loves the game. I mean, it's it's everything to him. He is sickly addicted to the game and getting better and winning. During the recruitment process, you, you, you kind of talked about how he wasn't lauded as, you know, maybe a top recruit. What was he like during the the recruitment process, and I guess with that, what like what what is he like as a person? Oh, there's so many things great about JC. I mean, it starts with his humility. He's humble. He has no ego, zero entitlement. Um, and if a guy ever had a right to be a little entitlement, it, it would be him, right? I mean, he's at Texas Tech for two years. We go to an Elite Eight and a Final Four, a national championship game. We won the Big Twelve Conference, uh, but you would never know it hanging out with Culver. He's you know, he, he here at Texas Tech, he treated the student manager just like he did the president of the university. And uh, his zero entitlement, real character, uh, not fluff. He has a strong faith. Uh, I think leads him in the right direction with life. And um, 
but he just uh, he's addicted to basketball. I mean, he's the real deal. He uh, high high expectations. Um, a great story to kind of illustrate this would be you know after Culver's first year in college, he was an NBA prospect. He had had a great year in the Big Twelve. Um, you could tell that he was going to play in the NBA one day. In a lot of ways, he led us to the Elite Eight that year. Um, and then where most players around the country, you know, start going through that process, Culver just had these high expectations. You know, he wanted to be the best player in college basketball. He wanted to win the Big 12. He wanted to win a national championship. He wanted to be a lottery pick. He talked a lot about wanting to be the number one pick, actually. Um, so his expectations were so high that he basically just got right back in the gym and went to work. Um, I think there's a lot of symbolism in that story about Culver. He knows what he wants. He knows what he's willing to do to get what he wants. He's very focused. And he has zero distractions. And Coach, when you were recruiting him, did you uh, was are these intangibles that you were talking about? Are those things that really jumped out to you right away, or did it take a little bit of time for you to kind of get to know him and figure out uh, what a special kid he was? No, he makes a huge first impression, and then he just backs it up. He's reliable. You can trust him. You can get to know a guy like Jared Culver very quickly because there's no, you know, there's no bull. He's transparent. It's real. And uh, with Jared, also in his special family, his uh, father Iwata is a is a minister, and um, he's a guy that that gets it. Uh, and his mom Regina is a hard worker and uh, helps people and has a big heart. And he's got the genes. I mean, his older brother uh, Trey is a Olympic hopeful, won the high jump at Texas Tech. He's one of the best athletes in the world, not just the country. Uh, should represent our country one day. Um, and his, older, uh, his other brother, J.J., um, is also a special player, um, was the conference MVP at Wayland Baptist, a nationally ranked NAIA school. So what I'm getting at is it's, it's there. It's real. Uh, he was raised the right way. He's got the genes. He's got the, the family background. and uh, He's got a strong structure around him, which allows him to be great. As a player, he kind of seems like the perfect mold for today's NBA. You, you know, you watch the NBA playoffs, and, and it's pretty easy to see Jarrett being a rotational player, you know, playing in those games with his ability to guard uh, multiple positions. But from his freshman year to his sophomore year, he took on a little bit more um, responsibility. Um, how did you see him handle that as, as a player and, and maybe a person with a little more pressure? Yeah, I would agree with your ass- assessment. I mean, basically, Jarrett's exactly what the NBA is about today as well as college basketball he's a positionless player um you can't label him as a one two three four he's just a player and um i saw that in him in our recruiting process he played for a really really grassroots good grassroots aau team and a great coach and when i saw him i mean he was kind of playing different positions and i remember telling him jerry you can play all over you'll play the point guard for us some and um he looked me right in my eyes and says yes sir that's what i want i know i can do that so he can play all over the floor, which I think is going to give him a chance to be a great NBA player. He plays on both sides of the floor. He's a very good defensive player. He's competitive. He's willing to play defense. He has a great desire to guard. He's a two-way player immediately. In terms of him accepting another role, you know, as a freshman, he played on a really good team. Um, and then as a sophomore, he became the leader. And he excelled in that. You know, he leads number one by example. He just works. You know, when your best player is always in the gym, in college, you've got a chance to have a culture that you know will give you a chance to win. And you know, I I know in the NBA it's going to be a huge transition period. There always is for young guys, no matter how good you are. Um, but Culver will excel uh, because he'll work, he'll stay grounded, he won't get too high or too low, and he'll be a leader. Um, I've always thought too the first thing about being a leader is you've got to be a follower. And you know, Jarrett will get there and he'll follow the the culture in Minnesota and he'll listen to coaching and he'll listen to veteran players and he'll be a great teammate. And then eventually, you know, he'll turn into a leadership role because he's going to be special. Just just throughout the draft draft process for him, um, obviously probably a little nerve wracking, especially after the first three picks, cause it seemed like people, you know, guys could have went anywhere. And obviously there's a draft day trade that, um, you know, couldn't have been uh, made official until July 6th. But um, throughout the draft process, were you able to talk to Jared and maybe give him a little advice? And um, did the Timberwolves reach out to you at all to, to get to know Jared? Yeah, so I, I was there with Jared, you know, from the day he declared and working out and choosing his agent and all the way to the green room. Um, it was one of the highlights of my life, and it was an honor to be asked by him and his family to be there. Um, so it was a special night. It was a special process. So absolutely, we were a part of it. Um, in terms of advice for Jared, it's real simple. Just just be yourself. Uh, do what got you here. Don't change. Um, 
stay consistent to who you are and keep the bar high and have your own expectations. And he did exactly that. Um, in terms of the prop, in terms of the process, I mean, every NBA team uh, in the league, you know, spent time in Lubbock or, or on the phone calling our people. So absolutely, I know uh, Minnesota did their work. Um, I think it's going to prove to be a a great draft choice. Not good, great. I think uh, as time goes on, people look back at the 2019 draft and know that it was a special pick with Culver. Well, Coach, uh, we know you're busy with camps and whatnot. Um, We appreciate the time and, and keep on doing great things at Texas Tech. Thanks for having me on. No problem.